Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Mary Ann Dewan, and I'm the Santa Clara County Superintendent of Schools. Over the past 18 months, our office has developed the Ways to Equity Playbook, a tool for schools and districts to use in their equity journeys. We will spend the next 90 minutes or so exploring how both the playbook and other resources from the Santa Clara County Office of Education can help you navigate your journey to equitable schools. I'd like to review a few logistics. Please note that we are recording today's webinar and following today's webinar, you will be able to find the recording on the Inclusion Collaborative's website at inclusioncollaborative.org. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A fe feature. Please note that the chat function has been disabled. Questions will be addressed by our panelists at the end of today's presentation. And we will also be using the questions to formulate subsequent trainings and an FAQ section on the Ways to Equity Playbook landing page, which you can find on the Inclusion Collaborative website. Throughout today's webinar, you'll have the opportunity to learn about the work that the Santa Clara County Office of Education and its partners engaged in over the last two years as a lead agency for the California Equity Performance and Improvement Program, or CPEP grant. You will learn about the Ways to Equity Playbook, which was the culminating project of the CPIP grant. And more importantly, you will learn how the playbook can be a guide for your own site or district's equity journey. I'd like to acknowledge our special guests for today. We are honored to have with us this morning our State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman. Also, California Collaborative for Educational Excellence, Executive Director, Tom Amarlino, and Assembly Member, District 79, and author of Assembly Bill 99, the Assembly Bill that funded the CPIP grant, Dr. Shirley Weber. I want to acknowledge and commend the many voices that contributed to the development of the playbook, including representatives from throughout the Santa Clara County Office of Education, some of our national, state, and local thought partners, and our local partner school districts and their leadership. At this time, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce California State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman. Superintendent Thurman is responsible for the largest public school system in the nation with more than 6.3 million students and over 10,000 schools. Since taking office, Superintendent Thurman has made improving equity, access and opportunity for California's public school students his top priority. He has created initiatives that are focused on closing the achievement gap for our state's most vulnerable students and is dedicated to supporting educators and delivering an equitable education to all students. It's one of the reasons he's such a great partner with our office. During his four year tenure in the assembly, Superintendent Thurman authored legislation that successfully expanded the free lunch program, bilingual education, and the Chafee Grant College Scholarship Program for foster youth. Additionally, Superintendent Thurman's legislation guaranteed preferential voting rights for student school board members, improved access to families for early education and childcare, and shifted millions of dollars directly from prisons to schools. State Superintendent Thurman is a social worker, educator, advocate, and public school parent who continues to work tirelessly on behalf of all students to ensure they reach their full academic potential. Funding for the equity work was made available via the California Equity Performance and Improvement CPIP grant. I welcome you, Superintendent Thurman, and welcome you to provide us with some opening comments. Well, thank you, Superintendent Duan. Uh, it is an honor um, to be with you today as you uh, announce and share this important resource uh, for California students and families. Thank you for your deep commitment to equity and for being a great partner to uh, all of us, uh, whether it's in your county or anywhere in our state. Uh, it's an honor to work with you. 
I'm grateful to be able to share just a few words today uh, on the um, release of this important um, you know, toolkit uh, to supporting equity in our schools. I, uh, this playbook is just important um, now more than ever. And I'm also grateful uh, to just say a word uh, to my colleague and friend, Assembly Member Dr. Shirley Weber. Uh, thank you for your continued leadership. And it was an honor uh, in, in one of my last duties as a member of the legislature to vote for uh, the funding in AB 99 that made um, the California Equity Performance and Improvement Program um, a reality. Um, uh, readings also to fellow speakers, uh, Tom Marmolino at CCEE, thank you for your partnership in this work on equity. Um, as, we, as we reflect on where we are with so many of our schools opening and distance learning, um, knowing that the pandemic itself has a disproportionate impact on many of those that this um, new uh, playbook seeks to support African Americans, English learners, and students with disabilities, it is hard to imagine um, the kinds of challenges that our students and families and educators are experiencing. I want to start by acknowledging the resilience of our students, their families, and all of our educators and administrators. These are unprecedented times to say the least, and I believe the toughest challenge that we will experience in our lifetime. But even so, our children deserve the opportunity to get a great and quality education. And we must lean in now more than ever to ensure that there are equitable access to ensuring that education. And just commending our families for all that they're having to deal with from the pandemic to many families uh, who were impacted uh, by fire, um, the devastation of lost loved ones, the devastation of lost homes, burned down schools, and, and, and terrible air quality. Uh, we know that there's so many challenges. We know that we're facing what I call the man-made pandemic of racism, literally watching uh, George Floyd killed, um, you know, seeing the trauma that our students experience as they watch that, as we watch the killing and the lack of accountability and the death of Breonna Taylor. All of these things have an impact on our students. And as I think about where we are, I think about where we were before the pandemic. Before the pandemic, we were having conversations about equity um, and we were getting to a place where we were able to make some things uh, be put in place to really support our, our next steps towards closing equity gaps and learning gaps. Um, many of you know, when I started as state superintendent, I immediately named closing the opportunity gap as our top priority. And I'm grateful for our four chairs of our closing the gap work and the great work they've launched to help us look at things like how do we diversify the teacher pipeline uh, to make sure that we have more educators who reflect the experience of our diverse student body. Um, we had some wins. We actually were able to get lots of money in the budget for uh, things like um, uh, our teacher recruitment and our teacher pipeline. Um, we were able to send you know grants to districts to deal with literacy. We sent a million dollars uh, in grants to two counties that have high challenges around literacy um, to, to continue to support our work towards equity. But after the pandemic, so much of what we were building and funding went away. As the pandemic devastated our economy, we watched the resources that we were planning to use go away. Uh, the reason I'm so grateful to you, Superintendent Duan, for moving forward today is because even though the pandemic you know, affected our, our budgets and our economy, it, you know, it didn't say that we could take a break from addressing equity and trying to close learning gaps. If nothing else, we have seen during the pandemic that learning gaps have been accelerated and have been exacerbated. And so it's so important, the work of what you're doing today to continue to move forward. And we commit to work with you in any way that we can. As you know, uh, several months ago, we announced a new grant that we were using to help school districts and county offices of education address implicit bias in our schools. We know that bias has had an impact on every sector from high rates of suspensions and disproportionate suspensions for African American students. We know that um, we have seen uh, in the pandemic learning gaps for African American students, for uh, English learners, for students with disabilities. And, and even though the state has created new guidelines to say small cohorts of students can come back to school so that students with disabilities can be served, uh, we know that we've got to do more and more and more to support students and their families. And so we announced the implicit bias grant that is now working and being built to support many of our school districts to, to tackle bias where it exists, uh, unconscious bias. We also want to address 
uh, in explicit bias and do some anti-racism work and anti-bias work. And for those reasons, uh, we announced just a few weeks ago, a new mini grant that we're making available to school districts uh, in what we call education to end hate. Um, Cause we know that education can play a tool. And at a time when we're seeing rising acts of racism and bias um, and bullying uh, towards so many, we know that we need grants that will allow us to address anti-racism work and anti-bias work. We are launching a new series uh, or a repeat series, uh, building on our first series just a, about a month ago of ethnic studies, where we give students of color an opportunity to learn about the accomplishments of their ancestors and making this state and nation a great one. Uh, so they can feel a sense of self-esteem and so that we can all celebrate in the accomplishments of Californians of color who've helped to make this a great state and a great nation. We also recognize that many students are impacted uh, by the pandemic in ways that they need additional supports. And uh, our schools have provided meals at 5,000 different locations, but many times students haven't been able to check in. They haven't been able to get support to deal with you know, counseling and depression needs. And so we've launched a counseling coalition where we bring together counseling groups of many different organizations to help create kind of a triage, a level of support, a system of support um, to address those who need additional social emotional uh, learning needs. As we move into this second wave of, uh, fam of uh, distance learning, we know it's important for us to lean in heavily on family engagement and we'll be making some announcements of some work that we'll be doing with school districts to make sure that families stay more connected. Um, we can't just say to families, well, if you're struggling, send us an email. A lot of our families don't even have a computer. Um, they may be using a cell phone. And, and so that is why I announced in March the task force on closing the digital divide. Um, we, you know, it's embarrassing to me as a Californian that in a state with our riches and our technology, we've allowed a million students in this state to go without the internet, maybe a million students who don't have a computing device at home. It is embarrassing to me to see California students in many counties trying to access the internet by sitting outside on the concrete outside of some business. This is California and I believe our kids deserve better and that we can create a model of connectivity that will be a model for the rest of this country to make sure that we close the digital divide. That is a key necessity for our work to closing our learning gaps and closing our opportunity gap. And for those reasons, I'm proud of our team at the Department of Education. Uh, we've been able to work with a number of legislators, a number of, of colleagues that to literally move hundreds of thousands of computing devices and hotspots. Many companies have come forward to help us in this way because um, we know that right now during this uh, time, it is hard to access computers and hotspots because of uh, a worldwide run on supply. Uh, but we won't stop until we found a way to make connectivity flow like electricity. And every student has access to high speed internet, including our students in rural communities who right now don't have the infrastructure uh, to be able to have access to the internet. We're pleased to work with legislators on the task force. Uh, we're pleased to work with the governor and the legislature who've made available $5.2 billion to support distance learning, to support acquisition of devices, to support social emotional learning and counseling and professional development for our educators and our teachers. Superintendent Duan, I again wanna thank you for your leadership. I'm looking forward to some time today as we learn and unpack the lessons that will come and spring uh, from the playbook about how we continue to lean in uh, to support our students and our families as it relates to equity. Uh, I'm joined today by a number of our staff, including our new Deputy Superintendent of Equity, De Dr. Daniel Lee, who's helping us build our own portfolio of equity strategies. And we look forward to aligning them with those that are outlined in the playbook and working closely with your speakers and partners and educators to continue in support of our 6 million students to bring equity to each and every one of them. Thank you for today and looking forward to our work together. Thank you so much for your powerful words, your leadership and your partnership. We are so grateful um, to have you at the helm here in California and we'll continue to collaborate with you and your team. Um, again, thank you for joining us and many of the issues that you addressed around equity um, do permeate in Santa Clara County and we join you in working together to solve those problems. This two year grant um, that helped us launch the playbook was a $2.5 million grant authorized by Assembly Bill 99 and was awarded to the Santa Clara County Office of Education 
and implemented by our Inclusion Collaborative. This and the San Diego County Office of Education also received a grant. The purpose of these grants was to build capacity. The Inclusion Collaborative here in Santa Clara County and the SCCOE branded our equity work as California One, the highway to success for all. While the funding for the CPEP grant ended in June of 2020, our office has made a commitment to continuing this work under the California One Highway to Success for All. As outlined by the National Equity Project, working towards equity means engaging in intentional practices and intentional behaviors, creating conditions in which each person participates, prospers, and reaches their full potential, interrupting inequitable practices and policies examining biases and creating inclusive school environments for each student and their families, and paying attention to the social and historical forces which create and maintain systems in which students are treated differently based on who they are. Our next distinguished guest is Tom Armelino, the Executive Director of the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence, or CCEE. Tom Armelino is passionate about serving the needs of children and honoring the unique and diverse backgrounds, values, and inclusive sense of community necessary to prepare them for success. Tom understands the importance of working collaboratively with all stakeholders within the school system through his experiences as a school, district, and county office leader. Currently, he is in his third year as executive director of the CCEE. And Tom is dedicated to supporting initiatives within California's system of support to build capacity and support continuous improvement through our shared equity focus. Welcome, Tom. Uh, good morning, Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Dewan. I want to congratulate you and your exceptional staff for the work that you've been doing for the last couple of years and really excited to help launch the Ways to Equity Playbook this morning. Um, I'm very honored also to be able to have this opportunity to always take this time to be able to thank our state superintendent of public instruction, Tony Thurman, and Dr. Shelley Weber for their steadfast and determined leadership, always focused on the inequities within our school systems and within society as a whole. It's my pleasure this morning to take just a little bit of time to, to explain the system of support and how that works in our new educational system. A lot of folks are very familiar with our our former educational systems, often in the past, that were really built around reward and punishment. The system of support um, is specifically named around, with the thoughts around support, and in particularly, it's designed to support efforts at the local level to connect school districts, charter schools, and county offices to resources and supports which increase their capacity to serve students, families, and communities and improve student outcomes. It's designed with a focus on collaboration and it's often uh, very much focused, if you'll notice, if you look at the circle in the very middle, it's focused around local educational agencies. It's purposely designed, as you'll notice, that the next layer out, as you look at the design, you'll notice is the County Office of Education. Our system now is built around local control. We're really believing that those who really understand the needs of their students live in those communities. And in particular, our county offices play a key role and are the first responders, if you will, to try and to address and help local districts address the needs of students. You'll notice this is the next layer out are other agencies, and I'm going to speak specifically more today around the equity leads. You'll notice on that very far right hand side, these are additional resources and supports that have been grants have been received and are purposely developed around some of the inequities that we see based on our dashboard data and based on other data around stu students that we know continue to struggle in our school systems. And so our state has done a nice job of trying to provide additional resources to help with that. And I want to share with you a little bit about our role in that work. If you'll notice on the left and you'll notice uh, that in particular on the left hand side of that diagram <laughs> that uh, we've kind of moved forward. It's okay. You'll notice very quickly that you'll see the CCE. And that's our organization, the California Department of Education. And then California, particularly we have a role of coordinating our work together and bringing all those agencies together when needed to be able to talk about ways that we can support the needs of other school, school districts in our systems. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. 
again, this uh, system was really built around trying to address some of the inequities and identify in particular content needs, some experts, if you will, in our systems who could develop resources, materials, and technical assistance for county offices of education. Uh, many of those are really focused around equity, special education, and English learners. Next slide, please. So today we're excited to help support the launch of the Ways to Equity Playbook developed by the Santa Clara County Office as one of those state equity leads. The playbook will provide the tools and resources to reflect on and implement culturally relevant teaching methods and to enact equitable practices across the county district or school site. The targeted approaches that you'll learn about today will support your efforts to improve achievement for student groups, including African American students, English learners and students with disabilities. At the CC, we are committed to help expand that work. And then we've also been doing some work in particular, everyone I believe um, is really trying to make some greater efforts, efforts to really focus around equity. We've done some work specifically with CASA, where we're focused on the needs of African American students, and KELSA, focused on the needs of Latinx students, working with UCLA. And in particular, many of us are referencing the work and the tools that have been developed both by the San Diego County Office of Ed and the Santa Clara County Office of Education that are specifically designed to address the inequities in our school system. We're proud to help amplify those resources and we're excited to be able to continue working with Santa Clara and San Diego County Office of Education to help amplify these resources and make sure that these tools get in the hands of those who need it. So thank you again for this opportunity to support the launch of the Ways the Equity Playbook developed by the Santa Clara County Office of that of education. And with that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Gary Waddell. Thank you, uh, Tom. It is a, an honor having you with us today and uh, State Superintendent Thurman as well and, and Dr. Dewan. I mean, we know that leadership matters in this work and so we're privileged to have such uh, strong and visionary leadership in our state and county. Um, the development of this playbook, it is a, it's a delight to kick it off this morning. Uh, it has been a journey. And as with any good journey, it's great to have uh, good traveling companions along the way with you, and we certainly did. I want to thank the development team from the Santa Clara County office, the writers, the developers, the, the thinkers who have lent their expertise, their passion, and their vision to bring this work to fruition. We also owe a huge debt of gratitude to our partners in this journey. Uh, prime among them was the National Equity Project, who served as a process facilitator as we really engaged in this work and doing our own self-reflection around equity uh, and um, to, to bring structure uh, to this work, as well as uh, WEAC, the Western Education Equity Assistance Center, Pivot Learning, Californians for Justice. Uh, we were honored to have some students from CFJ participate in our design team. Um, BERT's Educational and Inclusion Solutions, as well as some of our local school district partners. We wanted this work really to resonate with the lived experiences of schools and districts, so, so their voices were critical in this process. Uh, as in any uh, project grounded in equity, we needed to begin with building a common definition and shared understanding of what it was that we were talking about. And our design team chose to adopt the uh, National Equity Project's definition of student equity, that each student, each student receives what they need, when they need it, to thrive social, socio-emotionally and academically. And that, that really is the heart of this work and what, what this is all about. We know that this is the most critical work before us. Uh, and, and there's nothing more important that we could be lending our resources, our attention, our time, and our passions to. So uh, it's now my pleasure to turn this over to some of the individuals who have been central in the design team. This work was a, a collaborative process uh, based in liberatory design uh, with many voices. And some of the leads of that work will be with us this morning. It is my honor to recognize at this time, Kathy Wall, who's the director of the Inclusion Collaborative that has been the department at our county office that has housed this work. And uh, please enjoy learning about the playbook. Kathy. Thank you, Gary. Um, we are delighted to be here. And I have to almost pinch myself that we have um, gotten through uh, the launch of the Ways to Equity Playbook and it's here and it's available and it's accessible and it's free. Isn't that even better? Um, but um, 
I'm anyways, my name is Kathy Wall. I'm the director of the Inclusion Collaborative, and we were the recipient of the California Equity Performance Improvement Grant Program uh, through Santa Clara County Office of Education. And as Dr. Dwan has alluded, we called our uh, initiative the California One Highway to Success. And uh, we feel um, the California One is a metaphor um, working throughout the state of California that if you travel that highway, it goes everywhere. So we've had a lot of fun with that navigational term. Um, we developed our um, project based on a tiered uh, approach. So it would be similar to MTSS that people were very familiar with. Um, and so we developed three tiers. Um, the first tier um, was tier one in intervention, we called it, and it was much more universal. It's much more available and it's easily accessible by all. Um, and so we developed several online courses and we have a coaching component um, actually on a, a digital platform that was developed by CAST, UDL IRN, uh, called the learningdesigned.org. And um, we have uh, online courses and coaching as mentioned on this platform that are available. We have developed stackable micro credentials um, that can be um, added onto. And that's uh, one of our goals is to continue doing that now that digital learning is even more of a necessity. And we work very closely with CAST who are the national uh, folks who promote, support, and do the research for universal design for learning. The next tier, uh, tier of our California One um, Highway for Success is our two tier, tier two intervention. And that is a much more face-to-face -face type of support. Um, we, every year we have a an annual uh, state conference, Inclusion Collaborative State Conference, where we've embedded several equity topics and supports um, that are available and archived on our website. And we also have equity institutes that we did uh, quarterly the first year and then it they were very popular. So we did them monthly this past year. And we have several uh, topics that pertain to supporting and promoting equity within a school district. And those are also all, all archived, recorded and archived on our Inclusion Collaborative website. And then our tier three, drum roll, um, is much more intensive and individualized. Uh, we originally were going to be developing an audit, um, an equity audit of some sort that could be used, that districts could use, but we found in doing a lot of the discussion within the field that the term audit kind of, you know, is scary and um, not always well received. So we decided to develop a playbook that had lots and lots of resources available in it. Um, and we called it the ways to equity as a, your navigational tool. And we're delighted to uh, be able to share with it with you today. Uh, it has truly taken about 18 months to produce. We did a lot of um, uh, work with National Equity uh, Project to have conversations and um, really working through what the issues were and what districts needed. We had our district partners and we had several um, agencies that work with equity and support equity within our um, state and nation that helped support us. And so the culminating effort was the Ways to Equity Playbook and I'm delighted to be able to um, introduce you to Dr. Erica Boas, who um, did a lot of work with us and a very strong partner. So take it away, Dr. Boas. Hey, thank you so much, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. As has been expressed, we are totally thrilled to be launching the Ways to Equity Playbook today. And I can't begin to tell you how exciting it is to have such an amazing group here for its send off so that you have an idea of what you'll find in the playbook. In the next part of this presentation, I have the honor of sharing a high level view of the playbook's design and also presenting some specifics on how to use it. So by way of overview, I'll begin with this timeline. We started our work on the Ways to Equity playbook in June, 2019 with a period of research, investigation and ideation. While we simultaneously developed a core group of collaborators who would partner with us throughout. Toward the end of 2019, we moved to an intensive multiple month prototyping and iterating, drafting and revising period that took the efforts of many to arrive at this finalized product. And today it's launch. 
With respect to methodology, with the National Equity, Equity Project facilitating our early work and informing our design all along the way, we engaged a liberatory design framework, which is reflected in this timeline. So what's liberatory design? Liberatory design was developed by the Stanford D School and DS4 Design um, and is an approach to addressing equity challenges and change efforts in complex systems that's grounded in three core beliefs. The first is that racism and inequity have been designed into systems and thus can be redesigned. The second is that designing for equity requires the meaningful participation of those impacted by inequity. And third, equity-driven designs require equity and complexity-informed processes. So these orientations can be found at the heart of the playbook. From the start, our process emphasized partnerships, and we brought together a core group who engaged in the National Equity Project Liberatory Design for Complex Systems Institute, including partners that have already been named. From there, a writing and review team was formed and we met regularly to review drafts and grapple with difficult questions around content. At the same time, we held meetings with dist district partners to lift up their equity stories. And those narratives turned into our four district case studies presented in the playbook. All along, we were engaging the liberatory design approach as we developed and tested prototypes of various components of the playbook to ensure that they were technically accurate and also that they reflected an ethic of equity. In the early spring, as we sheltered in our homes, a core writing team continued to meet, share writing and research, and revise the playbook. In May, as final edits were being made, communications was also working their magic with the aesthetic presentation. Our hopes for this launch are to share our enthusiasm for the playbook, paint a picture of what's offered and provide you with some information on how to use it. To that end, today we will provide you with some details on what the playbook offers you as a user in both its print and digital versions. Our deepest hope for this playbook is that it will move, move sites LEAs, and even county offices away from compliance-oriented models of equity and toward the deep systemic investigation and subsequent practices that need to be undertaken to truly transform schooling so that all students are included, welcomed, and supported academically and socially every single day. The Waste to Equity Playbook is the culminating project of a two-year equity grant. It is a versatile navigation tool to guide practices towards student equity with accessible differentiated on ramps so users can honor their unique starting places that's packed with tools and resources for engaging in equity work. The on ramps, which I'll in a moment spend some time describing are for guiding the best possible equity work that can be done for this reason. We offer a way to engage in reflective developmental relational processes and not checklists. The playbook is necessarily flexible to meet the diverse needs of its users. And as I mentioned, the playbook is available in two formats, digital and print. The playbook is text dense because equity is complex. So if you're like me and like to read on paper, you might want a hard copy. However, it's also full of great hyperlinks to tools, resources, and references. And you'll need to use the digital version to access these with ease. Next slide, please. So the Waste Equity Playbook is grounded in five overarching approaches to undertaking equity work. First, it takes a systems change approach to understanding and taking action to advance equity in classrooms, schools, districts, and communities. Methods are based in continuous improvement strategies and a multi-tiered system of support or MTSS framework. It takes a strong stance that inequities are systemic problems and therefore equity is about changing the systems in which we live. Second, it's versatile and adaptable to various contexts. This is once again, not a checklist or a standardized one size fits all strategy for addressing equity. 
It is a process worthy of the time commitment necessary to carry out your vision for equity. We authors hope that the playbook will be widely engaged by diverse users. Third, it prioritizes collaboration and shared leadership across stakeholder groups by flattening traditional hierarchical leadership arrangements. And fourth, it humanizes data by rooting in the practice of honestly listening to, raising up, and grounding student and community experiences in the work to advance equity. It promotes the idea that all statistical data are made of multidimensional human experiences. And this cannot be forgotten as we look at charts, tables, and numbers that are also very important. Fifth, it centers targeted universalism with a focus on our three focal student groups, African-American, English learners, and students with disabilities. Universal goals can be met for all students by focusing on how to achieve equity for these specific student groups within particular contexts. In its simplest definition, targeted universalism alters the usual approach of implementing universal strategies to achieve universal goals. And instead, it suggests that we use targeted strategies to reach universal goals. Universal design for learning, which is highlighted in the playbook puts this concept into concrete practice. Next slide, please. So our table of contents provides a detailed outlook outline of the playbook's content. The bullet points here on this slide highlight a few of the key sections. These are how to use the playbook, our on-ramps, focal student groups, state dashboard indicators, and universal design for learning. I'll explain each of these one by one briefly, but I want to make sure that I highlight here that the introductory sections of the playbook have been written to provide deep context for our purpose or our why, which is to assist in bringing about an equity promise or intention that every child receive what they need to thrive in schools. We also have a section dedicated to thoroughly defining equity. So following this, we then offer a how-to section on engaging the playbook at the school and district level. This is followed by our on-ramps, which is a matrix that helps teams to identify their starting points and their routes to equity. I will tell you more about this facet of the playbook in just a moment. So after this, after the on-ramps, come sections on the three focal student groups, and each of these sections outlines the following a history of the inequitable policies and practice that have impacted these groups, and also how they have challenged these inequities. Current statistics, and which tools, resources, and practices can be used now to advance equity. In addition, the playbook offers explanation of the California dashboard indicators using an equity lens to understand what these statistics mean with respect to student groups. Guidance is provided on how to address the inequities reflected in the statistics using an inclusive, positive, supportive, and systemic approach. Specific content areas such as universal design for learning, social emotional learning, and culturally relevant pedagogy comprise about a quarter of the total sections of the playbook. As I mentioned, <clears throat> the playbook is necessarily flexible to meet the diverse needs of its users. The designers anticipated a wide range of users, so we developed a playbook that could be used in various ways. We hope that equity teams find the entire playbook useful. And we also know that sometimes there may be only enough time or capacity to work on a limited number of sections. Therefore, the sections can be used in articulation with one another, or they can be used as standalone content to guide your equity work. However, I do want to reiterate and emphasize that our hope is that the playbook is engaged holistically. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the Waste Equity Playbook also provides great detail on how to establish an equity leadership team that reflects the vision of equity that teams are hoping to achieve. We've included content on developing an equity communication plan and using data to drive equity work. 
Reflection questions help teams navigate the cultural and mindset shifts that are essential to working toward equity. The playbook is also rife with tools and resources that are really nice to have right at your fingertips. And we have a well-researched document here, document here. And so each section concludes with a set of select references that are also useful for the continued learning that's critical to advancing equity. Next slide, please. This roadmap here shows a high level view of how teams might think about designing their trajectory for equity work using our playbook. I should note that this process emerged from our liberatory design for complex systems work with the National Equity Project. And it reflects the idea, the important idea that listening to stakeholders closest to the problem is essential if we are to understand how to solve the problem. Let me give you a general explanation of this roadmap without getting too deep into the weeds. You're always welcome to follow up with questions about the specifics presented on each of these slides. So at the start of the process, a core team is in place working to define equity and taking the equity temperature using tools offered in the playbook. The findings of the investigation are then shared with multiple different groups to hear interpretations and insights on the findings. All of this information is then shared with stakeholders who are invited in to collaborate in prioritizing equity needs and articulating the challenges the local system is facing. From there, equity teams work together to identify an equity problem of practice and decide on which actions to take. Each of these steps can be informed by the various sections in the Ways to Equity playbook. Next slide, please. So now I wanna take a moment to spotlight the on-ramps, which we've alluded to so much. And the on-ramps are ways to beginning and continuing your equity journey. The on-ramps are a guiding document to help organize a complex and sometimes messy process of working toward equity. As the title suggests, this is a developmental rubric to help you assess and identify where you are in your equity work. The on-ramps were, were developed using Skrilla and colleagues' book using equity audits to create excellent and equitable schools, Curtis Linton's The Equity Framework, and importantly, collective input and feedback from longtime teachers and administrators. We designed these on-ramps with the understanding that equity teams would want to be able to identify a starting point and then build out a trajectory for their work. The on-ramps provide guidance on seven main domains, bolded on the left-hand column of the pages. These are, and I'll read them for you, leadership development, teacher staff development, data and research, planning, communication, culture and climate, and progress monitoring. Each of these columns represents a starting place, but the idea is that in order to engage equity processes and practices as fully as possible, you'll want to do your best to complete all of the activities listed in one of the columns within each domain. For ease of access, the blue column on the right hand side links provides links to related sections of the playbook. Next slide please. So let's zoom in a little bit more so that you can see in further detail how the on-ramps are organized. Here we provide you with a snapshot of the first listed domain, planning. Schools and districts at the beginning of their equity work will find themselves starting their engines, keeping with the metaphor, which is in the column numbered one. This is largely a position of learning and investigating the ways in which systems maintain, perpetuate, and we hope challenge inequities. Picking up speed is column two. Here's where teams are solidifying definitions, developing goals, choosing which tools they might use to aid them in their equity work, and then beginning to draft an equity plan. In the third column is where people really put their heads down and the work really ramps up um, in practices. Here teams have figured out how they are going to work, to get, work toward equity and they get to work finalizing equity plans and starting with one 
concrete equity challenge. Teams learn and iterate as they go. As mentioned, this last light blue column is where playbook sections most relevant to that particular equity area are linked. Each domain connects to three leveled sets of equity practices and activities that will assist teams in moving their local systems toward equity. Next slide, please. So the three pages presented here provide you with a visual of one playbook section. Every section begins with an overview of the particular content area and follows with a definition of the key concept being presented. In this example, implicit bias and cultivating equity mindedness. In each section, the authors drew from a variety of the most relevant and or current research on the topic and provided a brief review of the literature. A practitioner audience is assumed throughout the playbook. As you can see on the third page, which is the largest page displayed on the screen on the left hand side, a vetted set of tools and resources are presented throughout each section. And they're also listed at the end of the section as well. Understanding that sometimes the meaning of tools and resources can be blurred, we define tools as instruments that can be used as an activity and resources are usually larger, broader documents that provide further information. The tools and resources we see are the stepping stones that will help teams move their schools and districts closer to equity. We intentionally provided a vast variety of tools and resources knowing that each site will have particular ways of working and certain preferences for certain instruments. As I've mentioned, in addition to tools and resources, a set of reflection questions are also offered at the conclusion of the sections, which teams can use and should use to, to guide the extremely important facet of equity work that is personal and collective reflection. Next slide, please. And here's an example of one of the tools we recommend. So we have a vast array of tools, as mentioned, this is one example, which is actually an archive of tools. Um, so the playbook is big on protocols and we see discussion and activity protocols as a way to facilitate equitable practices from the start. Protocols make explicit aspects such as how long each speaker has to talk, discussion questions to be used, norms for listening and how and what content to engage in general. These are often practices that are taken for granted and it is precisely that which is taken for granted or normalized where inequities can assert themselves, even if unintentionally. So the National School Reform Faculty, which is the organization that's created this archive um, that we highlight in our, our playbook, offers hundreds of discussion and activity protocols with many of them explicit, explicitly addressing equity. This is one of various tools recommended in the playbook. And we know that schools and districts will find the right resources and tools for their work as they engage the relevant sections for them of the playbook. Thank you so much. I will now turn it over to Kelly Wiley who contributed significantly to the Ways to Equity playbook. Thank you, Dr. Boris. Keeping with targeted universal universalism, the playbook was intentionally designed to take a systematic approach to equity. To reach the goal, we've incorporated Universal Design for Learning, or UDL, to address engagement, representation, and action and expression. Social Emotional Learning, or SEL, to engage the whole child, and culturally re relevant pedagogy, or CRP, to bridge student identities and communities to the learning objectives and classroom expectations. To support the system support approach to equity, some of the tools outlined were deliberately rooted in the continuous improvement process. So the users that are already familiar with the differentiated assistance or DA process may deepen their root cause analysis and further explore system solutions. These tools are also referred to as improvement science. There are also a variety of online learning modules available to individuals so that they may deepen their understanding of UDL, SEL, and CRP. 
Participants completing the modules have the opportunity to earn micro-credential badges and a variety of UBL credentials. The modules can be accessed at learningdesigned.org. Dr. Briggs. Good morning, everyone. The African-American student population in California is in a steady decline. African-American students make up 5.3% of the state's public school population, a decrease from 2017-2018. At every benchmark in Black student lives from early childhood education through higher education, they encounter far more significant obstacles than many of their peers. Black students experience inequitable access to quality curriculum and instruction, receive less effective instruction regardless of the quality of the school. Moreover, Black students face racial discrimination in the form of implicit bias, microaggressions, or subtle racial epithets aimed at their race. This calls for equity. How do you think the African-American students are doing in your school, district, and community? In your, in your opinion, are they well? What are the factors contributing to their wellness? If you were to take a look at the data on African-American students in your school, district, or community, what will it tell you? Next slide, please. Culturally relevant pedagogy is a known strategy to drive equity in schools. Gloria Lassing Billings coined CRP in her 1995 article entitled, Toward a Theory of Culturally Relevant Pedagogy. She argues that CRP acknowledges and utilizes students' cultural and historical backgrounds, knowledge and experience to inform the teacher's classroom and methodology. The terminology and meaning of CRP has evolved over the past decade and is sometimes used synonymously with culturally responsive teaching and culturally sustaining pedagogy. Each of these frameworks offers a variation on the original concept of CRP. In another book, Lasting Billings emphasizes that students must experience academic success, develop and maintain cultural competence, and develop a critical consciousness in which they challenge the status quo of the current social order. Are there obstacles preventing African-American students from being engaged, feeling welcome, or achieving academically in your school, district, and community? CRP offers multiple tenets on what it means to accomplish CRP successfully and implementing it in your district. Some of those tenets consist of building relationships and a healthy rapport with students. Also, remembering race and recognizing the salience of race in the lives of African-American students, as well as students of color, is a major tenet of CRP. Moving be beyond materialism, that is challenging students to think about their identity in the multifaceted ways that they show up in the world besides being consumers and also thinking about how they are living in the capitalist society and their role in it. Accepting and serving in multiple roles and promoting self and school pride are also other tenets of CRP. Next slide, please. One of the tenets of CRP also calls for district sites to address the socio-political consciousness in their definition of CRP. Now this is vital for effectively tackling systemic roots of racism in American schools. When we reflect on the experiences of African-American students in particular, it's impossible to do that without looking at the legacy of slavery and the legacy of Jim Crow laws and other factors that barred and prevented them from receiving a quality education in this country. So CRP has to be recognized and looked at in the context of systemic racism. CRP can also help teachers in particular to create a bridge between the identities and the communities to which students belong while simultaneously meeting learning objectives and expectations in the classroom you can fulfill learning goals and objectives through CRP. They're not mutually exclusive. This tenet also requires the specific training of teachers 
on how to cultivate relationships, as well as make safe spaces where students can express their full humanity. Teacher education programs, professional development services, in services are all opportunities where, where individual teachers and educators could first take an inside out approach in examining them, their identities to inform the way that they show up and address their positionality in working with African-American students and students of color to achieve CRP. Now the tools and resources outlined in the playbook were designed to help increase equity for African-American students and students of color as a whole. For instance, there are educators who have been doing a remarkable job in implementing CRP in classrooms. One aspect of that work that we highlight in the playbook is the Algebra Project, which was founded by Dr. Robert Jones in 1982. It's a national math literacy program that continues to prove effective in bringing culturally relevant education to diverse students. There's a CA1 course that focuses on culturally responsive anti-bias teaching. And also we could turn and look toward other states such as New York. In New York, the education department works on culturally responsive sustaining education and looking at New York state schools, districts and communities to create well-developed culturally responsive sustaining equitable systems of support for achieving dramatic gains in student outcomes. The framework that they employ is grounded in four principles, which we advocate for in this section. And those principles consist of welcoming and affirming environment, setting high expectations and rigorous instruction, offering inclusive curriculum and assessment, and providing ongoing professional learning, which are all helpful. Taken together, all of these tools are useful in implementing CRP at the district site and classroom level. I leave you with a final question. What are the possibilities and limitations for better serving African-American students in your school, district, and community? What needs to happen to do so? Thank you. I now turn it over to Dr. Anna Marie Villalobos. Hello. Um, when we look at, hi, okay. When we look at students with disabilities and we look at the CASP data for students um, and their college and career outcomes data, it really is apparent that students with disabilities perform at a much lower level um, and have much um, poorer outcomes than do their non-disabled peers. Further compounding this inequity is the continued segregation of students with disabilities in California who are systematically removed from general education classrooms as compared to their disabled peers across the nation. The recent move to online learning because of COVID-19 has further exasperated these inequities. LEAs and schools have striven to redesign equitable instruction for all students, but have particularly struggled with implementing effective instruction for students with disabilities. How can the playbook assist the LEAs, the school sites, and the classroom teachers to address these issues? On this slide, you can, next slide, please. Um, we have some sample reflection questions that might assist the districts and school sites in addressing some of the issues, particularly for those for students with disabilities. For example, how is technology used as an intervention versus an innovation for students? This is particularly important for our students with disabilities. Is disproportionality present in those outcomes? And this is something that was addressed earlier within this, um, within this presentation in terms of our, a lot of times our students that are in, in socioeconomic situations, our students in rural, in rural communities do not necessarily have the access to the, or the bandwidth for um, distance learning, or they may not even have the tools, they may not have the technology. Um, are educators equipped to use and teach technology in equitable ways in their classes? For example, if, if we are online, similar to how we are right now teaching in the classroom, what are the accessibility issues that a student with disability may have? This is particularly um, important for students that may have sensory issues, if they're deaf and hard of hearing, or if they're visually impaired, how are those kinds of things being um, 
addressed in our current situation. Things to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So when we look, when we discuss and look at some of these things, we have to look at um, what are some of the resources that we can use. Advancing equity in an era of crisis is a guide to equity in remote learning, particularly important right now. Also, the US Office of Educational Technology, they have um, an equity resources available on their webpage. And also another source is Digital Promise, how to access to technology, um, how, how access to technology can create equities in schools. And um, next, please. In addition, there are some, uh, there are some resources um, more directly for special education, such as the Practitioner's Guide for Educating English Learners with Disabilities. This is a great resource, and this is something that will kind of lead into the next group that I'm going to be talking about. Also, the University of Florida CEDAR Resources and Reports. They have um, a number of online resources, including most recently the High Leverage Practices for Students with Disabilities that really highlight and high point evidence-based practices that can be used. And also the Center um, for Online Learning and Students with Disabilities is another good resource. The um, CEDAR resources and reports are phenomenal. And along with those are the National Center for Intensive um, Interventions and also IRIS and all those things are available in the playbook, the resources, and the three of those together really are a good source of information and tools for teachers, for districts, because of the way that they are, um, the way that they are, what's the word I wanna use, the way that they are put together, it's a great resource because they can be used for professional development. Next slide, please. The second, the third group that we're going to, that is really highlighted within the playbook are English learners. And although um, English learners constitute 19, um, English learners constitute 19.3% of the students in the state of California, they do not necessarily constitute a large percentage of the students who are graduating from high school or continuing on to higher education. The playbook focuses on the equity issues and opportunity gaps faced by English learners in academics, instruction, and long-term educational outcomes. One of the major issues is the opportunity gap in academic achievement. Over the last five years, more than 80% of EL students continue to perform at below standard levels on English language arts and the math sections of the CAST. When speaking of equity, we need to look deeper into the data of our students. The data is not just numbers. Each data point represents a student. When we examine the intersectionality of students who are EL, we find that many have also been identified as having a disability and are socioeconomically disadvantaged. So the intersectionality would be how many groups does that student fall into? Are they EL? Are they special education? Are they a foster student? Are they homeless? Are they in a low socioeconomic status group? <clears throat> The California Practitioner's Guides for Educating English um, Learners, though I shared that link with you um, earlier, um, is, was developed by the California Department of Education. And it's a great resource for when we're trying to tease apart um, how to work with students that are learning a second language and students that may have a disability and how to tease out, is it a disability or is it due to um, the student acquiring a second language? because we do have an over-identification of students who are English language learners within our students with disabilities in the state. Um, for example, um, the average amount of student population that is identified as a student with a disability within the state overall is 12.2, but for English language learners, it's over 16%. In addition, 20% um, um, of EL students are also students who fall into the socioeconomically disadvantaged category. So the playbook contains a series of reflection questions within it for this section as it does in the other sections, really honing in on things that sites of classroom teachers, districts can think about in order to, be, um, to really take a deep dive into how they're serving their EL community. So on this slide, I would like to direct you to resources to support LEA sites and educators that support their efforts in equity. 
The resources address the need for Yale students and students from diverse backgrounds to feel that they are a member of the educational community and their classroom. Teaching Tolerance has an, is an excellent source and has um, learning plans for diversity. Scholastic actually has lesson plans on multiculturalism, on using multiculturalism and diversity. Um, Santa Clara County Office of Education has a great initiative of my name, my identity. So important when we're talking about culturally relevant pedagogy and how we are really validating and affirming who those students are in our classrooms. And then there's also the UC Berkeley Othering and Belonging Institute, which specifically addresses the issues of othering other people so that there is no longer, there is no sense of responsibility. And how do we turn that around and make everyone feel that they belong? And now, next slide. Um, Dr. Boas, I believe it's your turn now. Thank you so much. Um, hi again, everybody. So, <clears throat> There are three aspects of the playbook that we want to present before we conclude <clears throat> our demonstration portion of this presentation. And these are the glossary, a list of audits and assessments, and our partner district case studies. As we know, cultural and mental shifts are required if we wanna move the needle on equity. There's nothing more indicative of culture than the language we use to describe our world. Therefore, in order to affect change with respect to equity, we need to be mindful of the language we use. Throughout the playbook, we use terms that may be unfamiliar to some, possibly uncomfortable for others. And to build cultural capacity for equity, we provide a robust glossary at the end of the document. <clears throat> In addition, the equity audits and assessment section is an annotated list of tools and services offered for those agencies who may be looking for this kind of support. Some of the equity, the audits and assessments listed come at no cost and others are fee for service. And finally, the district case studies lift up the incredible equity work that our partner districts have engaged. These case studies offer a concrete model for schools and districts looking for exemplars in equity work. We know that examples are so often very helpful in informing this complex work. And we were proud to partner with these amazing districts for our playbook. And with that, I'll now turn it back over to Kathy Wall. Thank you, Dr. Boas. Um, I would love to, we need the next slide, please. Oh, here we are. Um, I would love to acknowledge all the hard work that Dr. Erica Boas, Dr. Anna Marie Villalobos, and Dr. Angela Burtz and Kelly Wiley have put into this, uh, the development of this playbook in addition to many, many other people. This did not happen alone. It was truly a collaborative effort and we are delighted to be here to share this with you. Um, so what's next and how can you get more information about the Ways to Equity Playbook? Um, I would like to invite you to put on your calendars. Uh, we are going to be hosting monthly navigating equity conversations uh, with the playbook contributors um, every Thursday beginning in November, which is November 19th from 10 to 12. Um, and we will be going through the month of May so that we can have um, a lot more deep conversation and specific uh, addressing specific areas um, with the ability for uh, folks to be able to contribute and ask specific questions. So you will be getting invitations to that um, and we will be uh, promoting that uh, shortly. Um, if you'd like to um, check out our online learning courses that we have on our California One initiative, please go to Learning Designed or you can actually access everything on the inclusioncollaborative.org webpage. Um, we will be doing coaching and professional development uh, to support uh, the Ways to Equity document in addition to other several more specific things. So we encourage you to um, access, next slide please, your own free oh, digital copy if you go to this uh, website. Um, and as Erica mentioned, it is very dense text. So um, sometimes when you pull out a document uh, that's online, it gets kind of cumbersome. 
um, and you have to buy glasses that you know will um, help support your vision for the rest of your life. And so sometimes people may want to also order a hard copy. And you can do that by contacting the inclusioncollaborative.org also. Um, next slide, please. It's my Thank you everyone so much for um, all of your contributions to this playbook. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next distinguished guest, assembly member of the 79th district, Dr. Shirley Weber. Assembly member Shirley Nash Weber was elected in November of 2012 to represent California's 79th assembly district, which includes the cities of Bonita, Chula Vista, La Mesa, Lemon Grove, National City, and San Diego. Dr. Weber chairs the Assembly Budget Subcommittee on Public Safety and the California Legislative Black Caucus. She also serves as a member of the Assembly Standing Committees on Education, Higher Education, Elections, Budget, Banking, and Finance. Moreover, Assembly Member Weber currently chairs the Select Committee on Campus Climate, which was created to examine and mitigate hate crimes on California's college and university campuses. The committee also explored student hunger, sexual assaults, homelessness, and freedom of expression. She formally chaired the Select Committee on Higher Education in San Diego County, which explored the need for an additional higher education facility in San Diego and ways to improve the quality, affordability, and equal access of higher education in the region. In addition to these educational endeavors in 2013, Assembly Member Weber was appointed by then Speaker John Perez to serve as the California State Assembly's representative on the National Education Commission of the States. The ACS is a nationwide nonpartisan interstate group approved by Congress in 1965 to help states develop effective policy and practices for public education by providing data, research, analysis, and leadership. She was a faculty member and chair of the Department of Africana Studies at San Diego State University for over four decades. Deeply committed to education, she served for eight years as school board member and president at San Diego City Schools. And as an assembly member, has translated her commitment to education and social justice into her ambitious legislative agenda, including bills on K-12 re education reform, civil rights, public safety, food and security, protections for individuals with disabilities and voting rights. We are so grateful, Dr. Weber, for your leadership and welcome you to today's webinar. Well, thank you so very much for the invitation. Um, it was, I guess, a year ago, I was with you at your, um, your conference itself. And that's um, correct. Who would have, as, as old folks would say, who would have thunk that we would be <laughs> in this situation today? And yet, uh, uh, as I continue to exist in this pandemic, um, uh, there are some things, of course, that alarm us about the world that we live in. Uh, but there's also some things that continue to inspire me uh, that despite the challenges we face, people still find time to. Uh, to help kids, to try to make the best of their world, to help their neighbors, and to to live up to those things that they that they learned were of value, and that they can continue to apply, apply and really make life better. Um, I'm grateful that we've all mastered technology at this point. I, I think uh, those who are who have resisted technology for years um, are now uh, on the on the zooms. Uh, on the on the uh, uh, the highway in terms of of technology and and to that I, I am grateful and grateful to you for continuing with this effort despite the challenges that you faced and we continue to face in our schools um, more than ever uh, the issue of equity faces us every day and uh, when we began this process a couple of years ago with uh, Santa Clara and San Diego being identified to receive the grant uh, to work on the issue of equity I don't think any of us would have uh, been able to basically uh, get the wind beneath our wings in terms of the whole world realizing that there is such inequality and that equity is so essential. Uh, we've talked about it, but this, this pandemic, uh, particularly the pandemic of health, has exposed so many cracks in our system uh, that is so unjust and unfair, whether it's the health disparities between communities or whether it's technology that that is uh, we see the in, uh, inequality that's there in terms of who has access and who does not have it, uh, we see the challenges and limitations of our children's homes 
and their families and their ability to really assist in, in educating their children. Uh, the sad thing is that those who have continue to have and those who have not, unfortunately, sometimes continue not to have and even fall deeper into a, a, a chasm that is hard to crawl out of. And so we, we're going to be faced with some very unique challenges in the coming year. And, um, and as a result of that, you know, I am inspired by the two districts that have taken on the challenge of equity, because I think uh, everyone recognizes now that it's just not about equality and, and everybody getting the same thing. It's about people getting what they need in order to be equal, uh, that there are some in inequalities and, though, and we have to do equity. We have to do extra because of some of the societal challenges our kids face and that we face as human beings and that the fairness lies in equity and that you can't get to equality without some equity. And so these are the things that I think we, we constantly recognize are really, really important to all of us as we attempt to create a situation that's much fairer and more just uh, in our society than anything else. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be with you this morning because I know that um, uh, we're gonna face some unique challenges and, and it's going to be the folks like you who've taken the time and who have been intentional in your thought, intentional in your actions, uh, basically focusing on the hard questions and trying to figure out how to answer them. Uh, your playbook is going, I, was, I had the good fortune of listening to some of your presentations and the, the whole issue of inclusion and, 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 and how we're going to be culturally sensitive to issues and, and have cultural competencies that are so important and that sometimes people dismiss as being unimportant. And yet I think those of you who do the research but equally important, those of you in the classroom uh, see it every day that who we are is important. And we have to begin to understand each other. Uh, that was one of the reasons why I, when I pushed so hard this past year for AB 1460 to get ethnic studies uh, taught in all of our universities, the CSUs, uh, mainly because that's where you're going to get your teachers. That's where you're going to get the folks. We, most of our teachers come out of the Cal State University system. And, and we have to equip them with uh, the information about this, the state that we live in. You know, California is one of the most diverse states. And, and we have, and our population shows in our schools, as I listen to your data, uh, that, um, that we have tremendous challenges among the diversity in our schools. Not something that we should fear, but something that we should embrace. Uh, and, and once we, we have the information and knowledge about the challenges and the history of the folks who live here that we just kind of ignored, uh, maybe we have a couple of, of uh, cultural diversity days where everybody brings a favorite dish and, and wears a costume that looks like that, that particular dish. Uh, that is so that, that is not what diversity is about. And, 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 uh, and now we're going to hopefully get the information at the university. But in addition to that, that we will be able to also support our teachers with the issues of equity and how do we, how do we get to the point of diversity and inclusion that is so very important. It is intentional. And we see it in the streets every day as people are protesting for themselves and for their inclusion and for their rights and for their justice, uh, that it is, it is present and it's upon us and it cannot be ignored. And, and, that's, and that's important. Uh, I just simply want to say, you know, as uh, I, I, I've been a, a bunch of these Zooms about all kinds of topics. And, uh, and oftentimes, uh, you know, the, the phrase is that, you know, we're going to take this moment and make it into a movement. And, 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 and folks are talking about what they hear in the streets and what they see in inequalities and all those kinds of things. And that's absolutely correct, that this is a movement. But I tell people it's more than that, it's a life. And, and, and so, cause oftentimes movements start and stop and, and they achieve small goals and they move on. But the issue that you face of equity and diversity and inclusion, all those things are life journeys. They're not something that you accomplish quickly and you walk away. The things that you will do all of your life, you have you will spend your entire life trying to deal with the issues of equity and diversity and inclusion, because they're so central to our democracy, they're so central to our schools, they're so central to our success and who we are, and we will not leave. We will not be successful simply by accomplishing small goals and walking away. You know, I find every day that I'm still fighting the issues of equity and diversity because it keeps changing. And it, and it morphs in different ways and, and we don't always have a system that supports it. And so it becomes imperative that we recognize that this is a life journey. This is not something that we will accomplish and move away from. And if we don't take it as a life journey, then we will suffer the consequences of upheavals 
off and on, off and on, success and failure, success and failure, because we have not realized that this has to be embedded in our DNA, this is who we are, that we're gonna fight for these things and these things are going to improve our life as well as the life of others. You know, I often say uh, on the, in the assembly when we're talking about equal opportunity and access, I say, you know, that um, issues like diversity and equity and inclusion and equal opportunity and democracy, those are principles that are rare flowers that are special and they require us to take care of them to be mindful of it to water it to give it food to give it sunshine to give it life to give it love all of those things are special and we think this we know they're special and they require an intentional behavior but the issues of discrimination and inequality are are basically weeds and you know what they grow best in neglect that when you put together this beautiful garden at your house and you think you've got your, your garden, your, your flower bed just looking great, then you say to yourself, oh, I've done it, I'm through. And you go in your house and you come back out in another two months and you discover that you can't find those pretty flowers anymore, that the weeds have come and choked them out. And that's what we discover in this country every day when we don't, when we're not mindful of, the, of, of our responsibility to protect uh, the equity to make to ensure equality for everyone to talk about diversity and inclusion and to answer the hard questions of how are we going to form a diverse society uh, in this in this in the state and in this nation and if we don't pay attention to it then we are always frustrated when we discover that we've gone two steps forward and three steps back that we are still fighting the same battle we fought 20 years ago and I tell people, are you really fighting the same battle or did you fight the battle and walk away and come back 20 years later and discover that whatever you did has been overcome by something else? So this is, this is, this is a, an amazing experience that you've done. I'm looking forward to getting the a copy. I wrote all the information down of the playbook to look at it because I think it is important. It's critical. It's good work. But keep in mind, it cannot be put on a shelf. It cannot be hid. It, it is it's a living document that will continue to grow and to expand and to assess itself. And it will be used. It is only good if it is used. And if it is not used, then there's no point in having it. And so I just simply want to thank you, uh, thank those of you, Dr. Waddle, thank Kathy for reminding me to be here, my staff for standing on top of me and making sure that I didn't schedule anything at 10, 10 to 10.30 this morning. Um, and, I, and I'm grateful to, to, to Zoom. I mean, that has allowed me to be in uh, multiple places in a matter of minutes uh, and, and, and meet with folks up and down the state that normally I would have had to fly to and spend a whole day. But, but I just want to thank you guys for the work that you're doing. You and, and San Diego have made me so proud. And um, we're going to look at this, uh, what we've done. I'll talk with the uh, superintendent and uh, because we have a lot more that we need to do and a lot more that we need to fund and need to support. And I just want to thank you for being our, our first recipients uh, and really taking this to heart and doing some great work that all of us in California will benefit from. So once again, thank you so very much. Please be mindful of all you do and take care of yourself and be safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Weber, for those powerful words and great reminders. And, and really the um, playbook is a tool to support that disciplined leadership um, that keeps us really uh, daily engaged and persisting and advocating and fighting for uh, each and every student in our systems and uh, the support of the legislature, state superintendent and others to, to help make this happen uh, is really key and sustainability will also be very key. Thank you again for your leadership. Dr. Waddell. Thank you. Uh, and let me echo thanks, uh, Dr. Weber, uh, for your heartfelt comments. Certainly we see this uh, journey, this tool as a beginning of conversations, not as kind of an, an end of them in any way. So thank you for that for that uh, reminder and for State Superintendent Thurman and uh, Executive Director of CCEE Armelino for being with us this morning. We do have a few minutes for some questions that have uh, come in from our, our Q&A. We won't likely be have time to get to all of the questions and we will address the ones that we don't in our uh, FAQ that will live on the uh, Inclusion Collaborative webpage. So we will we'll jump right in with a couple of the questions. Um, I would like to begin with uh, Dr. Boas. Um, so we have a question about how the governance team engages in the process of leadership development and policy direction. And we know that 
any strong equity work uh, is both an artifact of practice, working on the practice level as well as the policy level. And both of those fronts are necessary and essential for us to be uh, successful in this work. Dr. Boas, could you talk a little bit about uh, how, how the playbook would be used uh, at a site level or how a governance team might be engaged in that process? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, so as I mentioned in my presentation, we have a few pages dedicated to how to build out an equity leadership team. And we think of leadership in traditional ways and we definitely took that into account when we were creating this, um, this playbook. But we also know that equity work requires that we reconceive of what leadership means. And so first and foremost, we want people to be able to do that. Um, however, we, we know that we're working from a set of existing policies that are already in place. And so the idea, and um, Dr. Um, Ibram X. Kendi also writes about how important it is to change policies um, and that it's within the policies that inequities live and breathe. And so we need to be attending to the language of our policies, to the impact of our policies, to the practices that policies um, 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 enact right through them. And so I think, I mean, I think the question is around, um, you know, how important is it that, that we look at policies and we create, develop policies that are equitable um, and that we really put the time in to think about that. However, we don't wanna get stuck in defining policies before we move to work. And so there's, there's this really tender balance that has to be struck, I think, when we, when we engage in equity work around defining and developing policies and, and starting to do the work necessary um, with, with, our, um, with our brilliance and creativity that's required before policies, especially in um, institutions, can get changed. And so I really, I, it's, it's the work that's been done to create policies and change policies is so important. And also the work that's been done on the ground is equally important. Thank you, Dr. Bose. While you're with us, uh, let's switch uh, to teacher preparation. Mm -hmm. We have a question that uh, just a wondering why teachers don't get anti-bias, trauma-informed, culturally relevant teacher training in their preparation and certification programs. Any thoughts? So as a person who's taught in teacher preparation programs, um, I would say that actually it is it can be taught depending on the program. And the problem that we have is that we have this um, um, imbalance within our teacher preparation programs where some are very social justice oriented, very equity oriented. The professors, the, the instructors are quite ready um, to teach on that and they do. And then we have other programs that don't um, make it of import in their programs. And so I think the bigger problem is that we don't have a strong um, um, connected system in teacher preparation that really um, values the work around equity and social justice work in the classrooms and for teacher educators too. And, and I know that a lot of teacher prep programs are trying to build this out right now and, and integrate it across their, their, um, their coursework and also their field work as well. Thank you, Dr. Boas. Dr. Birds, if we could uh, turn to you. Uh, we have a question uh, that case studies are powerful and certainly uh, one of the components of our toolkit was were, uh, is for case studies. Um, but in the name of social justice, uh, the question is in solution, is the solution to the inequity embedded in school systems that have caused trauma or embedded, embedded in the solutions built by those being traumatized and how much of our design process has been built around using the ideas of people and organizations that represent those being traumatized uh, by current systems rather than solely the complex ideas of, of teams more broadly. Um, Dr. Birds, could you chat with us about that? Oh, I, I'll answer that specifically to the chapter on CRP. So the information presented there, um, the theory that foregrounds the chapter as well as the resources and tools that I provided are coming from researchers and authors who've spent time in the field doing work. So for instance, um, I mentioned quite a few times that 
we embrace the definition by Dr. Gloria Lassen Billings, who is a practitioner herself, who also has worked with students and families to drive not just the outcomes of students, but also those definitions behind the terminology. So for the particular section, I will say that you can infer that the examples that are being cited have come from the voices and the firsthand experiences of African American students and their families, though there are always opportunities to learn more about what those untapped stories are. But what you'll see is coming directly from um, not just the equity team or even my lens as a person who wrote the chapter, but what I know to be true and what's actually successfully reaching the demographic of students outlined in the section. Thank you, Dr. Burks. Uh, Dr. Villalobos, if we could turn to you. Uh, we have a question really about frameworks and how uh, the intersection of, of our framework, state frameworks with the toolkit. Uh, specifically, this question is about the California math framework that's currently being revised and how we might crosswalk uh, this, this kind of resource with that. But I think it also opens the door to a broader question about, about how we think about equity in this work in the context of standards and frameworks. Dr. Villalobos? When we look at, um, in looking at the current revisions that are undergoing within the frame, the California math frameworks, um, specifically, I'll start with that first. Um, the ideas of incorporating UDL, uh, culturally, incorporating culturally relevant pedagogy, um, that are, those are addressed within the frameworks. So those are two key functions that I think are really important that are embedded within the new frameworks. Um, when we're looking at um, student engagement, when we're discussing student engagement, um, culturally relevant pedagogy and UDL um, are what I consider the keystone, the, the foundational work um, to, um, in working with students. They talk about affirming, um, uh, there's actually a huge overlap because one of the um, first things out of the shoot the UDL wants you to do is before anything is to have multiple means of engagement for the student. Um, this aligns with um, culturally relevant pedagogy because you're talking about how are you affirming the student, how are you making the, um, the, the work relevant to the student, and how are you validating the student, and how are you acknowledging where the student comes from. And a lot of that is really overlaps a lot with UDL. So I think um, when, we're, when we're looking at um, student engagement and we're making sure that we're involving student choice and we're involving student voice, and we're also looking at um, the social emotional learning piece. I think the playbook is really good at pulling out those three factors. They're like the three legs of a stool, the SEL, the cultural relevant pedagogy, and UDL. All three of those things um, are really the cornerstones of student engagements and how you can get students hooked into learning. Um, so I would say when you're addressing any of content, that those are three items that really must be addressed right out the chute because if you don't have relationships and if the students don't feel safe and if the students have that desire to learn, then that learning process will be significantly hindered. Thank you, Dr. Villalobos. I, uh, we have gotten enthused and carried a little bit over our time. We do have some more questions that we would love to address in FAQs on our uh, page. I would like to add my thanks to our uh, developers, to the thinkers, to our teams that have developed this, as well as our uh, distinguished guests who are with us today to kick off this work. You know, it is our hope that this resource will be useful to you in the real work uh, that you're doing about creating more equitable schools and systems across the state of California. There's no more important work before us today. So thank you for being with us. And we look forward to, uh, to have, hearing your feedback. Please stay in communication with us through our Inclusion Collaborative website. And, uh, and we would love to support your process. And thank you again for being with us this morning.